It's a quest. It's a quest for fun. Well, The Rock says, why don't we just cut right to the chase? Okay, now he, uh, you know, he wants to get together. Well, you know, he wants to talk. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. It's showtime, folks! What are you? I'm... Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the interview series here at Neuroculture. I am your host, Ryan, and our guest this week is actor, producer, director, so many other things that this young man has done in such a short amount of time. He is the one and only James Palmature. James, welcome to the hey. show. How are you on this Friday? Oh, doing great. Glad to be here. By the way, I love your intro. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. that. That is created by yeah. Josh Bauer of J Bauer Arts. He is the man behind all that wonderful goodness that you saw a few moments ago with the intro. So thank you for the feedback. I'll be sure to pass it on to Josh. And Josh, if you're watching, thanks, man. We love you. <laughs> so once again, James, thank you so much for being with us now to kind of dive right into this here. What were some of your favorite movies or TV series when you were growing up? Oh, that's a... That's a fun one. Um, I gotta say, uh, one of my all-time favorites is uh, Indiana Jones. Uh, really big fan of kind of action adventure. Um, and I was a Star Wars fan as a as a kid, but I think I was more into that action adventure drama uh, uh, genre than I was than the sci-fi early on. Nowadays, it's kind of coming back, like more sci-fi is coming in. But uh, <clears throat> I'd say Indiana Jones. Uh, Goonies. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't like Goonies, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they never say <laughs> die. I'm sensing a pattern here with some of these <laughs> yeah, characters yeah. or properties. Does this really, yeah. let me think, is this the 1980s we're talking about? Yeah, pretty much. Hmm. Pretty much. Yeah, you can you can see where my influence comes in there. <laughs> No, I, yeah. I got no, I got no problem with it. Full disclosure: When I go to Comic Cons, when Earth was open before the situation with the <laughs> yeah, pandemic, right. I did cosplay as Indiana Jones. So you're amongst family here when it comes to the Jones family. Very nice, very nice. So, no worries there. Any uh, TV series pop out at you? Some of your favorites that were growing up? Well, <clears throat> growing up, uh, yeah. I mean, okay, here we go again. Saved by the Bell was a fun after after school uh, after school favorite. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, Time animated. out. No, I'm kidding. Go I'm, ahead. <laughs> yeah. Animaniacs, I got to say, was uh, um, popular. I mean, I was in high school watching Animaniacs. I mean, car cartoons were a, a good source of uh, good entertainment back then. Um, nowadays, I'm more into kind of post-apocalyptic type stuff. And I don't know if that's influenced by our current world predicament, but... <laughs> But um, the Walking Dead, all the different Walking Dead series are kind of on my, you know, favorite list right now. All right. All right. I like I like this. I like that. I mean, granted, there's like, what, three or four kind of Walking Dead series now? I mean, they, there's a spinoff yeah. of the spinoff of the spinoff now. It's just, Yeah, exactly. It's like, where am I in the universe here? <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of hard to keep up with. Now, granted, I've watched a few seasons of Fear, The Walking Dead. But after yeah. a few a season or two, I was thinking to myself, yeah, there's other series I got to focus on. I can't do this anymore. Too many zombies. Thanks. I'm gonna yeah. walk. I'm gonna walk over this way. No worries. Yeah, right? you know the, the fun thing with these shows is that you know they start off with you know a lot of zombies and it's the you know, calamity of the zombies and then they get into more drama stuff and then you kind of lose the zombie for a minute and then it's like wait a minute the show's supposed to be out be about a zombie apocalypse and then they bring back the zombies for another season and like more stuff into it so. With these spinoffs now, we'll see what else they explore, but, uh, you know, keeps us entertained. Of course, of course. No, no doubt about it. Now, when did you make the decision that you wanted to become an actor? When did that happen? Uh, that, that happened actually really young. My, my parents were both musicians, and uh, when I was, you know, this tall, if you can see, uh, you know, my parents were on the road and I would, I remember sleeping in my dad's guitar case backstage while they were performing. So I kind of grew up around entertainment. So I always had that inkling that I want to go in that direction. And, you know, of course I did drama in high school. Um, and then when, by the time I got to college, I actually, I actually started as a uh, engineering major. I was going to go to Caltech. Uh, I went to Occidental College and I was in, I got accepted into their uh, what they call a 3-2 program. You get your master's in five years. 
for engineering. And about halfway through my second semester, I switched back to theater and film. And I've stayed in that direction ever since. And um, don't regret it. Wow, that's a, that is true. That is truly amazing. So being an actor, all this kind of wonderful things that go into it, it runs in the yeah. family. Yes. Yeah, definitely performance. All my siblings, you know, play instruments, have done some art. You know, I, I, I'm the only one that's pursuing acting, you know, in the family or filmmaking in the family. But everybody, you know, my, we all had a lot of artistic uh, pursuits. Wow. Congratulations. That's amazing. Now, I was running through something known as your IMDb page. And I'm just curious. <laughs> I'm just curious. How was it being a part of such projects, or should I say such movies as Bedazzled, I believe it was, from the year 2013 going on 30? Any thoughts on those two? Uh, Bedazzled and 13 going on 30 uh, were actually some really great things to work on. Um, Bedazzled uh, is, was really a fun, actually. <clears throat> I got hired to play a, an NBA basketball player because Brendan Fraser, as you know, turns into this superstar and, you know, and so he's about, he's like six, two, I think something like that. And, uh, he's supposed to be gigantic in the film. So they hired a bunch of people, my height, five ten, to play other players. And so we had to actually rehearse for about a month to learn doing movement coaching to kind of move like we, as if we were six, four, six, eight, you know, tall. And so when we shot, we shot the film, they actually shrunk the basketball hoops down. So all of us five foot 10 people <laughs> were having fun dunking, you know, pretending we're badasses when we, you know, I definitely was not. I mean, I could, I could barely dribble the basketball when I got cast and I had to, <laughs> I had to work on my skill. And actually, as a matter of fact, it, I was like the laughing stock of the audition process because we showed up in this gymnasium. These, these ballers are yeah. coming in doing this fancy stuff. I mean, these guys played basketball, you know, street ball. Some of them played for college and they're trying to show off. And I'm like, doop, 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 come up and do a layup. And I'm wearing these like track shorts, which are short shorts and this tank top. So I just look like a total nerd. Mm. And so people are kind of like chuckling, but it, it ended up drawing attention to me. So, so the, the casting people were like kind of eyeballing me because I was drawing so much attention. Uh, not for the right reasons, unfortunately, but <laughs> but as it turns out, they start pairing us off with with a real basketball player who's super tall, and um, they're like picking people. It's like getting picked for a team, and you're we're sitting in the bleachers, and they're like, "Okay, you come on down," and people are like, "Hey, okay, yeah, you come on down," and it gets down to the last person. So yes, I was the last person picked, and I'm sitting there, and he looks, and I kind of stand up. I'm like, hey, I've been working hard for this audition today. <laughs> you know, I didn't say that, but I was thinking that. And he's like, yeah, okay, why not? And people like, ah, so, like erupted in, in applause because they're like, this is the last guy you think they'd pick. And uh, and then, you know, that, so they pair us up with some, you know, our counterpart who's taller. And he makes this joke, hey, it's mini me. So that kind of sealed the deal for for them. And I ended up getting the getting that role. Um, and shooting shooting wise is way different than what you're going to see for the foreseeable future we had a thousand background that they brought in we shot at the great western forum here in los angeles and they brought oh, yeah. in a thousand background to be crowd and we're on the actual court and i'm just looking around with like this crowd of people and then like two thousand cardboard cutouts to fill out the rest you know <laughs> uh so it was actually really amazing um and, you know, all the basketball stuff there, you know, the thing with the audition process is they said, look, you don't have to be like a, a, a great basketball player per se, because we're going to be teaching you certain plays and you're gonna, it's all going to be choreographed. Um, so that's kind of how I made that, made it through the cut there. And, I, and that month of rehearsal gave me enough time to, you know, hit the gym every day and practice and kind of at least get more comfortable handling the ball before we before I completely embarrass myself on set. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's, that is really amazing. Did you get a chance to yeah. speak with Brendan or Elizabeth Hurley at the time? Uh, I spoke with Brendan uh, because we're in the, in the scene. Um, so he, he's a really nice guy, by the way, I've actually worked on a couple of productions. Uh, I think I, I was on, I, I was a background uh, 
on I think Monkey Bone. If it's, oh, is that, okay. Is that it's yeah, and that's that another was, one of his films. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. That was my first uh, kind of first time meeting him um, briefly because you know background. You try to you know you don't want to come sure. up and crowd the, the the cast, but but on uh, Bedazzled it was you're you're cool. You're one of the the in crowds. So so you're there and you're working with the director and and the, uh, the choreographer and, and it's a lot of fun. Hmm. All right. Did yeah. you get a chance to, uh, to squeeze in a few words with the lovely Elizabeth Hurley, who was on the no. court as a cheerleader, I believe. <laughs> she was, she was, but, uh, uh, no, I think she made a brief appearance, but we, we really didn't get a chance to, uh, interact, unfortunately. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> nah, it's all good. Just thought I'd ask the question. Uh, oh no, and, no, I and, and a big fan of hers too. I mean, uh, of course, everybody's oh, she's beautiful, you know, beautiful person, a uh, very talented person, uh, but also just a, just a fan of her work at the time. So, mm -hmm. yeah, a absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Any any fun stories from the set of uh, Thirteen Going on Thirty with Jennifer Garner uh, and Mark Ruffalo? Yeah, that's another kind of an interesting way about how that happened. Uh, 13 going on 30, I was actually hired as Mark Ruffalo's stand-in. Oh, wow. So I, yeah, so, and I and I have another story with Mark Ruffalo that goes back before that, which is kind of a, an actor struggling story, but I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Sure, <laughs> sure. But uh, yeah, I, I was hired as, as Mark Ruffalo's stand-in. Um, and so went through most of filming uh, in that role. And then we got down to the scene that I ended up being in, which is the, the night out. She, uh, Jenna Rink goes out on the, you know, the first night on her, on a town as a new 30 year old mm -hmm. and goes to the party and, and that whole thing happens. And I'm the guy, you know, that she throws, uh, she throws pineapple in my drink and she like throws a piece of shrimp and it hits me. And, um, oh, I think okay. I, I think, I think they, they called me shrimp guy or something like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, that, that was, um, uh, the, the pineapple and the shrimp happened in the same scene, but they were shot like a month apart because oh the, the shrimp happened on the day. Like I walked through and I'm there on set and a stand is like, okay, you, you're going to do this part. So it's a little featured bit, right? Oh, perfect. All right. Put me in. Put me in, coach. Come on. Uh, so they put me in and I, we do the little bit. She's walking through the scene and she takes this, you know, shrimp cocktail and tosses it over her shoulder and it hits me. And, you know, I'm like, oh, what the hell? You know, so ha ha ha. And then it later in uh, in reshoots, w one of the executives says, hey, she because she takes a, a bite of her pineapple and throws it off the balcony. And they're like, the executive say, hey, you know, it'd be great if it landed in someone's drink and they're like, Oh, let's make it the same guy. So they call me back in for this, to continue this, this bit. And uh, the reason I know about this is because they talk about it on the DVD making of like the behind the scenes. Sure, and they yeah. actually like, Oh yeah, that's his stand in and blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, Oh, thanks for the shout out guys. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, so that was shot on different times and, and the, and, Anyway, the, the thing I'll say about Mark Ruffalo is um, he remembered me from an encounter years ago had prior to working from him. And that remembrance was the time that I was sleeping in my car in front of his house. <laughs> oh my. So, so here, here's that story. I, yes, uh, 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 early on out of college, you know, I, you know, struggled a little bit and there was a, you know, a, a, a troublesome period where, you know, I had to decided to sleep in my car so I could catch up on bills. I owed, you know, my orthodontist, I owed my acting coach. I had credit card debt run up. I'm just like, I need to get ahead of this stuff. So I'm like, I'm going to just not pay rent. So I stayed in my car for a couple months and I couch surfed on my friend, you know, with my friends and, uh, and I paid off all that debt and, got back into my own place eventually. But during that time, I did a lot of couch surfing. And at the time, one of my friends uh, happened to be sharing, he was renting an apartment in, this, in, the, in the same house that uh, Mark and his wife were, were living. They had a downstairs uh, 
uh, studio and he had an upstairs studio. And so I was couch surfing and, and staying at my, my friend's house. And I come home from a, a set late at night and he was a bartender at the time and was out working and I couldn't get in the house. So I just like fell asleep in my car out front. And so Mark Ruffalo comes home late at night and sees me there. And so he goes up and knocks on my friend's door. He's like, Hey, your friends, your friends downstairs. I'm like, Oh shit. So he comes and wakes me up. And you know, so Mark had remembered that when I got on set, I'm like, yeah, I'm that guy. <laughs> I'm that guy. But, uh, I got to say, but a little note about that, that uh, struggle that actually ended up being one of my, um, most productive times. And as a matter of fact, as soon it wasn't, it was less than a year later, I, had a Super Bowl commercial. I was starring in SS Doom Trooper. I was being flown to Europe to for a month to shoot this movie. I mean, I, I literally went from my bottom to living my dream uh, all in the course of, you know, eight months, maybe eight months to 12 months. My goodness. Yeah. That, that is, uh, there's not too many words I can use because I'm just <laughs> a little bit i'm a little bit flabbergasted that's amazing man you, you get to see all these different faces and work with all these different people and you came mm -hmm. you know through these kind of you worked with these people in different circles in different ways that is couch surfing i haven't heard yeah. that term in a long time so yeah you know yeah th it, thanks for making this feel so <laughs> young <laughs> here, here on the show here at neuroculture we do we do appreciate that but thank you for sharing that with us that is truly amazing about those two different movies and of course you know crossing paths again with mark Ruffalo and all that jazz. That's really good stuff. I'm, there's no doubt about it. Now, what is it that you think you would enjoy? What do you enjoy more? Do you do you enjoy working in front of the camera or behind the camera more? What would you say to that? You know, I, I get asked that all the time from my wife <laughs> because oh. because I, I go back and forth. She's like, which one do you prefer? I'm like, well, I really actually enjoy both. I mean, I I started off in front of the camera and I still pursue and as a matter of fact here, here's the deal i make films so that i can cast myself in them <laughs> you know, that's one of my motivations okay so uh <laughs> you know so that that you, as you can kind of see but i actually really enjoy the filmmaking process and and uh right out of of college when i graduated from oxy i was looking into going to um uh, AFI for my master's degree in cinematography. So I was geared to kind of do that. And then I decided, no, I don't want to add another 30 grand to my student debt. So I didn't do that, <laughs> but, but I, you know, started acting and, and got, you know, did, uh, outside of college, went to, you know, Hollywood acting schools. And that was, that's my pursuit. And then it got to the point where I was like, well, I feel like I want to kind of start creating, some opportunity for myself. And I, you know, kind of went back to some filmmaking that I learned in college and started doing that again. We started doing short films and then we, you know, grew from there. And I really and equally enjoy both processes. But uh, like I said, if, if I had to put an edge over one, I'd say acting, because again, I'm always looking to put myself in whatever I'm filming. So I have to say that that's, that's my priority. I mean, that's a really long winded, uh, answer for uh, I prefer acting. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, that's yeah. it's no problem. We do appreciate the explanation as to why you would pick one, maybe just pick a little, little bit more so of one side over the other. Yes, yes. So yeah, it's it's no it's no problem at all. And I want to take this opportunity to let our audience know for those of you who are watching this live, we do appreciate. It. If you have any questions for our guest James Palmetter as we go throughout the course of the show, leave them in the live chat. I've been monitoring it. I'm enjoying looking at these comments, and a few of you have brought up some questions. I'm going to bring those up as soon as I can. Before we get to our next question with James, we would like to share this with you. What was it you promised your old man? Never give up. Do something they'll never forget. I'm afraid I am a coward. I'm sorry for everything. Hey. This is my moment. You'll be missed. If I had done this a long time ago, a true movie land tragedy. it would have saved a lot of pain. Peg Entwistle. Known for her spectacular Broadway performances and a promising movie career, is gone. They'll never forget this.
gives me mm. chills every time. <laughs> my, my goodness gracious. So the question that everyone wants to hear the answer to is simply this. What was the experience like making Hollywood Girl, The Peg and Twistle Story? Uh, it was my best independent filmmaking experience to this date. Um, it was a lot of work. It was a labor of love for all of us. And we did it, you know, on a shoestring bu budget for a short film. Uh, but we had a lot of talented people involved. And um, I got to say, I would do it all over again. Uh, even with the amount of work and that went into post-production, learning everything that I did, which I can talk about, um, I would go through that again because it, uh, it was so rewarding. And I'm, we're so happy with the story that we completed. And, you know, as a filmmaker, I, I'm so picky and I'll look at it and I'll pick stuff apart and I'll be like, oh, I would, you know, change this to that or I'd do that better. But overall, I think we did, a, we put together a really great story. Um, we, the, I'm proud of what we were able to accomplish and also what, what everyone else brought to the table. Uh, Laura Ligori did a fantastic job as Peg Entwistle. Um, she actually helped us bring in some really great other cast members. We got real uh, Will Rothar from uh, Battle L.A., <clears throat> his father, Michael Rothar. Um, he's a nutty professor, too. Uh, we got Dan Reardon, the voice of Megatron, as the radio announcer. You heard that in that trailer. Uh, you know, uh, Maureen Teefee, uh, she plays, she's in, she's in the film. So uh, we just, I got to direct some you know, some pretty established actors, uh, which was really great as an independent filmmaker, you know, um, it's great when you have a chance to actually, uh, you know, direct someone that you feel is above your peer level at the time. And uh, so, you know, to have some actors that have been on some, some blockbuster stuff is great. And uh, yeah, uh, amazing experience. And um, I might add, uh, there's a few other things that go along with this. We had, you know, uh, some very obsessed um, fans. <laughs> we had a few run-ins with the ghost. Uh, <laughs> hmm. um, uh, and we had, I caught an EVP on tape and it made it into the final cut of the film. I left it in on purpose. So for, oh I mean, this is, this is nerd culture, so we should all understand what EVP stands for, but just in case, electronic voice phenomenon so you're you're out there filming and later you play back the tape and you hear voices on the tape that weren't there when you were recording and so i caught one of those um and i guess i'll just get into that because i'm sure you're wondering what it is and where it's at <laughs> <laughs> no no i i mean yeah i mean i've heard the term electronic voice phenomena i have the i believe it was a 2005 film white noise starring batman mm -hmm. himself michael keaton mm -hmm. oh yeah thank for that because they made that and then they made a not connected at all sequel called white noise two with nathan fillion right and i believe yeah, I who else was in that the starbuck what's her name oh uh, from Battlestar Galactica. no no it wasn't her it was somebody else doggone it can't remember the somebody, person's name it's killing me somebody in the chat better chime in and like yeah whoever that girl was in uh, longmire is oh gosh why is why am i blanking <laughs> on her name but anyway anyway uh, so, this, this wow, you heard me. voices Ghost, when you were filming up there? Yeah, Liz. yeah. And by the way, Ghost Hunter is another one of my favorite shows. Ghost Hunter is just the... Oh, Ghost Hunters. Okay. Yeah, Ghost Hunters. Yeah, it's a, you know. But anyway, yeah, so the voice, so there's a voice. Um, the last, I think it was the last few days of shooting, we were shooting in the theater. And we had rented this old, um, this, it was actually a theater at an elementary school in Woodland Hills. Um, it was fairly old, um, but you know, you know, every theater has its ghost, right? I mean, that's the whole, that's kind of the, the theater tradition. It's like they're all haunted by some, someone, mm. um, you know. So, so we're we're shooting, and and um, that's the day where we had Will Rothar, we had Michael Tifi. My my dad played a role. I brought my dad in. I, you know, we brought him in from Arizona, huh. uh, put him in the film, and. Um, my 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 mom came out and she wanted to help so she ended up being the uh, uh wardrobe 
I think she did wardrobe for the day. She's like, I want to do something. I want to do this. Because we had a skeleton crew. It was me. The film crew was me and a sound guy. You know. Wow. So, so I'm trying to set up lights and run the camera and direct people. And then also, in some cases, be in the scene and direct myself. You know. Um, and on those days, we brought in a couple extra camera people to help out. But for the most shot, it was like a one, you know, kind of a two-man crew. Um, so... Any I mean, kind of, I, I digress here, but uh, so we, we go back and I'm editing and, and I'm going through the, the take and it's the opening shot of the film. She's, Peg Ann Wessels is sitting in front of her mirror and she's mm -hmm. getting ready to go on stage and she gets up and she walks, she walks out through a curtain to go uh, into the backstage area. And right as she's passing through the door, you hear, don't go in there. I'm like, whoa, I mean, it's really distinct. Don't go in there. And then there's like something else and it sounds like someone's name. And I, I thought at the time it was my wife's name. Don't go in there, Veronica, you know, cause she was, she was, you know, running sound for us at the time. Oh my goodness. And so she's like, that's not my name. That's not me, shut up. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, it's not you, but definitely don't go in there. And everyone's like, wow, that's crazy. And I was trying to figure out like, you know, where it came from, don't know. So. You know, I go through uh, in post-production, I go through and, you know, you clean up all the audio track and r remove yeah. noises that aren't supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. Something, someone's in the background and they knock something over. Obviously, you don't want that in your in your film. Mm -hmm. um, but that, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to leave this in because of the legacy of Peg Antwistle and the, the you know, the, the legend of her haunting the Hollywood sign and all this. I think this would be really fun to have this phenomenon in the film. So it's it's literally, like I said, it's... 20 seconds into the film when it comes up um, now it's covered with music so you can't hear it as, as clearly but if you listen carefully right as she walks through the the door you might still you can kind of still faintly hear don't go in there which you know however you want to you know place meaning behind that but i wouldn't say that necessarily was her ghost but who knows i mean we to build on this kind of ghost story and and if you guys get a chance to speak with laura Ligori, uh who played peg um, you have to ask her to tell you her ghost story because she had a poltergeist in her house during the filming of this. And I believe she actually brought someone in to exercise her apartment. You'll have oh, to confirm boy. that with her. You'll have to confirm I will, that. I will have to add this to, to <laughs> the show notes because we were actually going to be speaking with Laura tomorrow on the show. Oh, so I, I'm going to have to bring, yeah. thank you for uh, giving me the tip. I will have to add that to my notes. So thank you for yes. bringing that up. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. So given that we had, you know, we had, a, we had a ghost, you know, that kind of hung out with us for the production. Um, there were some, some people that, you know, people, there's a lot of really uh, devoted fans of Peg Entwistle, especially here in LA, because she has, she's part of this Hollywood history. So there, you know, there were people that were just very excited with the production as we're shooting. And we had a lot of, uh, you know, people anticipating when's this going to be out. And so it was kind of like, we're doing it for ourselves, but we feel like we're also doing it for this community of, uh, of people that are really into Hollywood history. Uh, so we kind of, put that on our shoulders as well. Like we, we want to do a good job and we want right. to tell a story that puts her in a good light that where you feel empathy for her. I mean, she committed suicide and you know, this film is more of a cautionary tale about, you know, <clears throat> just kind of in those times of, of despair, finding some, finding a way to hold on, you know, her, her, uh, Peg Antwistle, as the legend goes, um, you know, a day or two after she committed suicide, you know, allegedly this, she received uh, a telegram offering her a part in a play in which she commits suicide. So um, that's, that's kind of the Hollywood folklore that's built up around her story. And so, you know, my, my kind of, uh, my take on, on the story and, and the, the meaning behind this for me was like, really about just you know, hold on for one more day, you know? And so that's what, that's what I want to kind of portray with this story is just, just hold on for one more day because good news is around the corner. And that also kind of, you know, just reminds me of when I was going through a lot of heart. I mean, I, I didn't get like suicidal or anything like that, obviously, but, um, but I just remember when I was going through my hardships, how, 
much better things got like immediately following that because of the mindset that I put myself into. And you put yourself into a positive mindset when you're down, you come out better when you're, when you're, when you're in a better place. So that, that's, that's the meaning for, behind the, the, the film for me. Mm. Wow. Absolutely. We can yeah. certainly agree. We can certainly agree with that. Now, moving forward a little bit here, are there any actors or directors that you hope to work with somewhere down the line in the future? Yeah, all of them. <laughs> it's probably a long list, you know. But I, but if you had to, you know, pick a few out of the bag here, what would you what would you say? Are there any actors, directors you would want to work with if you had to pick like two or three? Uh yeah, I would. Uh, my gosh, um, directors, I uh, definitely would want to do like work Peter Jackson. I'd love to work with Tarantino on his thing. I mean, all the greats. I mean, you can mention any director. I mean, this kind of goes without saying you'd love to work with any of them. But in particular, you know, I I, um, I think it would be really great to work on a Coen Brothers film. Meet those mm. guys. I really love their, their the old brother, Warato, Lady Killers kind of <laughs> comedy area of that. Um, act, acting wise, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. Mark Ruffalo, I'd love to work with him again. Um, <laughs> get get the get the friendship, get the friends back together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I work with. Uh, I I got a chance to work with uh, Harrison Ford, um, um, and um, that was great. Uh, but who else would I? It's like I, I'm trying to like single someone out, and it's really hard because I, I you know, as a as an aspiring you know, artist and filmmaker. I mean, anyone that is, is, uh, is on that level, you're going to be happy to work with. And I know that's, that's too generic of a, of a way to answer the question, <laughs> but, but I mean, yeah, I, I think I would, I would, um, I would actually enjoy, uh, 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 uh oh my gosh, cause you're on the spot and I, you know, your my mind goes blank, yeah. but, um, Gary Oldman, I would ah, really Commissioner love to Gordon Gary himself. Oldman. Yes. Yeah. He, he would be one of my top choices. Uh, Ian McKellen would be Ooh, Magneto, one of my, yeah. yeah, actually I study his acting closely all the time for uh. his camera, for his camera technique. He oh. is really great at subtlety of, of eye, his eye movements, everything. Fascinating. Um, you, you see some of that in, in the lower of the rings. He's got a lot of close ups where he's doing stuff with his eyes. Um, sure. It's Gandalf. Yeah. Yeah, Gandalf, and and then you know in Magneto, there there's there's actually one shot in Meg. Uh, I think it's um, X Men Two. Oh, X Men United, yeah. Yeah, is is that the one where he's he's raising the Golden Gate Bridge? Oh well, that that'll that actually might... be X Men Three: The Last Stand. Oh, that's three. See, okay, see, see, I get. There's so many too. You get lost in that. There's a lot of movies in certain franchises, but don't worry. That's why I'm here to help. But yeah, that yeah. would be X Three X, or The Last Stand. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there, for. As an actor, for some reason, the, that shot where he lands the, the Golden Gate and then it kind of pushes in on him, there's that moment there as an actor. I watch that clip and I'm always inspired by that at, at, for, for just the way, how he is in that moment. And I don't know if I can put a finger on it now. Maybe it's just physicality of what he's doing. But that, that shot, oh, I, I always come back to that shot when I'm thinking about camera technique as an actor for some reason. I'm going to have to figure no, this out. <laughs> but, that's cool. It's fascinating. I, yeah. I respect that 100%. Yeah, so, you know, not a lot of people not a lot of people like to bring up X-Men 3 because that's one of those films everyone <laughs> likes to forget. But you know what? I, look, it's I did about a rewatch. Moments, okay? moments. Yeah, I did a rewatch of it recently. Do, do, I, do I think it's as good as I remember it? No. But <laughs> I still have some certain parts and there are certain themes in that movie that are really important to speak on. So – I applaud what they did in certain pieces of the film, maybe not all of it as a whole, right? But there are certain parts that do stand out to me as well as James over here. So we'll, we'll give you <laughs> X three. We'll give you a break. So give us give us some little bits here. Get a little bits. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 not a problem at all. But those are good names to uh, potentially work with when it comes to actors and or directors somewhere down the line. Fasc fascinating stuff. Now, what would you say have been some of the rewards and or challenges of working in the film industry? Well. It's a it's a tough business to to work in, and you really have to, um, as, as a uh, what's a, we have a line in in Hollywood Girl, um, 
uh, my God, I'm forgetting my own writing here for a second. <laughs> you have to have, you know, <laughs> so someone in the chat, you have to have a lot of, of, uh, of, uh, of grit, you know, mm -hmm. you, you gotta stick, you gotta stick with it. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it can be very rewarding and it can be very frustrating because you feel like you does, you work hard and you feel like you deserve the, the world for the hard work that you want to put into this, but it's so hard to kind of break in. Um, and they, there is a saying, like, if you become a success, overnight success is 10 years, you know, you're an overnight success. If you do it in 10 years, you know, for me, it was, it was six years before I kind of made a break and I got, you know, um, you know, got my, I got the Super Bowl commercial and I got this film, which is weird because I kind of did it in reverse. Like you would think that, working you get a little bit roll then you get a little bit bigger roll and you get a little bit bigger and you kind of build on that well i i had a couple little things right but then suddenly my first my first like break was a super bowl commercial playing spider-man and a lead role in for the sci-fi channel <laughs> and i was like okay yeah i can do this you know um but that's not a story of challenge that's a story of like you know that's a, that's kind of the opposite of your question, but, uh, but I, I would say just the time it takes to really feel like you're starting to make progress for most people, I would say takes longer than you would expect when you first start out. And so you have to learn to think of things in the long haul. You have to be in it for the long haul. People come out here with a two year plan and they're gone in two years. People that come up here with, come out here for it with a 10 year plan, they're still here and they're making progress. And that, that for me is the biggest challenge is to just keep at it despite not getting not Like they say, every time you get a no, you're, you're closer to getting a yes and you get a lot of no's and that is the hardest thing sometimes to deal with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that with us. Now we are going to turn things over to you. For those of you who are watching this at home, we have a few questions uh, here for you from our good friends in the chat. Real quick, hanging with Web Show Web TV, that would be Garrett, Sage, Dina, everybody else, that family. They say, Ryan, you got to ask him about SS Doom Troopers. Now, what exactly oh, yeah, is yeah. SS Doom Troopers? Without going into too many details, can you tell us what that is all about? SS Doom Trooper is a, uh, a, a sci-fi original movie. Uh, stars Corin Nemec, myself, Ben Cross, oh. um, Harry Van Gorkum, Marion Feely. And it's a it's a film. It takes place World War II. So uh, American soldiers, kind of a kind of we call it the dirty half dozen, are sent into occupied France to take out a secret German weapons lab. And we'd come to discover that they've created a super soldier. And so we're fighting that. That's and and that was that's the project I referred to where I was like living for the first time. I felt like I was living my dream. Uh, you know, we shot in Bulgaria, mm. Sofia, Bulgaria. Um, oh, wow. And a little little bit of trivia about Bulgaria is like they they got the hell bombed out of them in World War II and they never rebuilt. They just built around everything. And so uh, we're shooting in these like with these like you know craters from from bombs and like bl blown out factories. That was all real. They didn't build any of that. Those 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 were left over from World War II. They never rebuilt. So we had caution tape around these areas. Like don't fall in that hole over there. You know, so. Yeah, one of those, one of the great, great times of my life for sure is working on that film. Hmm. And I'm by the way, check, I'm gonna have to check that yeah. out one of these days. Yeah, my my character, I, I'm Private Parker Lewis, and it's kind of a nod to Corin Nemec, Parker Lewis can't lose, and that came from sci the execs at Sci Fi Channel. You know, the, the producers were like, you know what, let's let's change his care. Be funny if we change his name to Parker Lewis. And then I have a line in the film where I say, I just can't win as I jump out of a plane. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's yeah. you can watch that's available on demand right now you can um uh oh, nice yeah it's a sci-fi channel original okay all Check right ss, Do it's SS doom troopers it's a it's a good fun film like you know their movie their movies of the week are a lot of fun and hmm. uh you know I, I think we we nerds can can appreciate that Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to have to check it out one of these days. Uh, hanging with Webster Web TV, this isn't more of a question. It's more of a statement just to be a little bit more specific from your IMDb page. They say, IMDb, you're labeled as guy hit by shrimp. Okay. There you go. Yeah. There you have it. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what, yeah. Yeah, they called me shrimp guy on set, and then that's what ended up on IMDb, guy hit by shrimp. 
Yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah. And uh, Brian, Brian here has a question for you. He says, what is the best advice someone has given you that you've implemented into your work, your work and or life? Uh, don't half ass it. That's, that's uh, kind of a, that's kind of a worth ethic uh, that I got growing up um, that come from my, my, my family, my parents. You know, if you're gonna, if you're going to, if you're going to do something, commit to it. You know, do it, do it to the best of your ability. And so I, I've kind of adopted that as my motto. Don't just, don't half-ass it. So if you're gonna, you know, I don't care what you're doing. If you're shooting something, if you're shooting a zero-budget project, don't half-ass it. If you're shooting a huge you know, studio back project, don't half ass it because you don't want to get fired. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> you know, so that, that, yeah. that's it. I mean, really just, if you, when you commit to doing something, it really think about why you're doing it and, and put, give it your hundred percent. I mean, you can give, you can give multiple things a hundred percent at the same time in your life. I mean, it's, you know, it's, you, know you can give a hundred, if you have two kids, you can give a hundred percent to each kid. If you have a couple projects, you can figure out how to give a hundred percent. But that that's 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 the goal that I live by is to try to, you know, to, you know, do the best I can. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would 100 percent agree with that. Gregory Lee, one of our team members from Neuroculture, he has a wonderful question here. He says, what would you say is the most challenging thing about getting started in the film industry? Yeah, getting started is um, it's if you're starting from nowhere it's the hardest thing because you don't know where to start. Like, do I go to an acting class? Where are you? I think the best thing to do, um, to, to answer the question, the hardest thing about starting is knowing where to start. Mm -hmm. That for me was trying to figure out yeah. where do I, how do I get even get started? You know, cause you're, I, you know, I was in college and studying theater and film, but that's still in a, you know, a educational environment. Now, once you leave, okay, now how do I get on that movie over there? Right. So um, that's, that's the hardest thing. And I think the best thing to do is to, is to surround yourself with like-minded people, uh, especially with people who've already gotten a little bit of a start and that can offer advice. Uh, and that's kind of what I did. I, I mean, I got into background, started doing background work um, just to get on set mm -hmm. to kind of learn and understand like the, the different types of people that you work with I mean, in terms of like crew positions and, um, you know, uh, figuring out how as an actor to get an agent, you know, was like, oh, what do I do? You know, okay, starts, I start sending headshots to all the different agencies and no one calls, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's like, okay, now how do I get on their radar? And um, that's figuring out where, where to begin and having a strategy is probably the best thing to do is to build a strategy of, okay, I'm going to, get access to these certain people like this. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to go register with central casting and I'm going to try to get on set and meet some, uh, even if you want to be a camera person, you know, if you want to be a, a DP or something, getting on set in any way you can is an opportunity to learn and observe. And so that's how I, that's how I started. And that's where I kind of, that was my biggest challenge that to, to kind of break through in that. And then from there you start getting, you know, you start, hearing of other things you can do and hey try to do this thing or that um i know i'm kind of going really long-winded on this but um but that that was that was it for me it was like i i want to do this but how do i even start you know um i i think i i think going being in school was a big uh a factor because i know a lot of people that just came out here from um from all over the world uh straight out of high school and just started trying to work in the industry and they go through a lot of hardship because a it's really expensive to live in LA so you're trying to work in a field where you're it's hard to get work and so you have a day job while you're trying to do get paid for doing the work you love and it's a struggle and I was fortunate enough to have four years of college out here to kind of get used to everything get to kind of get the layout of the land. And, and so that for me was a nice transition uh, so that I felt like I can kind of hit the ground running 
right out of right out of college. Even though, like I said, how do I start? <laughs> you know. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I got you. I got you. A few more questions here. And unfortunately, we're running a little short on time. So we're going to have to try to kind of sort of kind of do this a little bit rapid fire I'll here, James. I apologize. Su- That's fine. I'll try to get more succinct answers here. <laughs> yeah. This will maybe put you to the test a little bit. But we're going to kind of yeah. do these here rapid fire. So, ladies and gentlemen, our next question comes from uh, Brian once again. He says, Who are your director influences and some of your actor influences? Uh, director influences, uh, for sure. Um, well, Steven Spielberg is obviously, uh, um, Indiana Jones, one of my favorite films. So, uh, George Lucas, Indiana, is Steven Spielberg, George Lucas that, you know, they did the Star Wars and the, um, they're, they're a big influence. Peter Jackson has been a big influence in, in the, through the Lord of the Rings. Um, Woody Allen has been an influence in terms of, uh, independent when when i when we're shooting independent film i i often think let's go woody allen with this because uh he has a, a way to a write characters that are very interesting and also shoot a scene so simply it's just like a camera shot it's a camera with two people talking but you're engaged the whole time and so when i'm working on a uh you know uh, indie film i try to remember that is like i gotta make this interesting with with little so i'd say woody allen and his filmmaking style has been a big influence uh, as an independent uh, filmmaker all right totally dig it totally dig it now once again man brian you're just firing away with these questions my friend i gotta (laughs) tell you you got some good ones here there's no question about it if there was one film in history that you could be in what movie would that be Probably Indiana Jones. <laughs> yeah, which one? There's like four. Yeah. Well, people I, like to say was, the fourth one never happened, and, they would, and that's fine. But yeah, if you had to yeah. pick any of them, which one would you want to throw your hat I, into? I would be, no no puns intended. Original. Yeah, it would be the original. I mean, that for me, that's the ultimate um, action-adventure film, so I would want to be in that. Um, I would love to be in The Mummy, the original Mummy. That would have been a lot of fun. I mean, these are that's these are like fun films. You know, this is like I, yeah. I think I would have the most fun on this. You sure. know, and that that would be action adventure. Mm-hmm. Now, with the mummy, are you referring to 1999 with Brendan Fraser or the original Brent, yeah. original with Boris Karloff? Uh, Brendan Fraser's. Uh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I was like, where are you going uh, with this? Because there's a few different you know, mummies out there. Yeah, you know, I didn't think about like historically, like even old films. Uh, yeah. yeah, I haven't, yeah. I haven't really thought about that. Mm. Yeah. Well, It'll take you know, too much time. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It's okay. You can think about it and then uh, discuss it. You know, either off camera, you can send I would, me a message. I would, no worries. I would probably choose an Alfred Hitchcock uh, film. I would probably choose maybe something like Rope, or <sighs> Rear, actually Rope or Rear Window. I would choose one of those because those, those. Yeah, you know what? That is also another big influence of mine. To go back to the other question, Alfred Hitchcock's sure. Rope is a huge influence because. My our other feature film that we shot, uh, Love, Lust, and Room Key, was originally intended to shoot as a one-take film. It was a feature film, but it was supposed to be a one-take film, and it was going to be shot like Rope. Now, it ended up being more of a traditional shoot and, and what it morphed into, but that was my original inspiration. So I, I, you know, I should put myself in Rope just so I can have that experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, real quick, my favorite Hitchcock film, at least of the ones that I've seen up to this point. I haven't seen all of them yet. Rope is one of them I haven't seen yet. But of the ones that I have seen, Rear Window is my favorite. Yeah. So no yeah. Wor- no worries there yeah. with that one. I'll tell you that. Jeez, yeah. Brian, where, where are you coming up with these questions, dude? What are your <laughs> thoughts on using Kickstarter as an indie filmmaker? Well, we used we used it for um, Hollywood Girl. Um, oh wait, we used there's two of them. There's Kickstarter and there's Indiegogo. Indiegogo. We used yeah. Indiegogo. But if you're if to but using uh, using crowdfunding for independent film, I think is really good because you kind of you kind of build an audience as you at the start. You know, so you've got people that are willing to chip in because they want to see your project come to light, but then they're also waiting to see it, right? So you kind of starting with a with a crowdfunding um, is a good way to kind of get some buzz going for your project in the first place, and also help raise some funds. Um, and I think now, don't they offer equity equity uh, fundraising now? Like you can actually, there's law, there's like uh, you know. There's laws about raising capital, uh, but they worked out a way that you can actually, I think you can give people equity in your project, raising money through them. I got to, I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't done that, but, 
but yeah, so we use we used uh, crowdsourced crowdfunding partially for Hollywood Girl. The rest of it, we put up the money ourselves, but we got partial funding too, like that. So I think it's a good tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right on, right on, right on. Now, as we get towards the end of the show here, any upcoming projects that you can tell us about? Yes, I am. Uh, as you see here, I'm actually running some experiments at home with uh, virtual production. Oh. Um, uh, it's how they shoot the Mandalorian. Uh, they've got LED walls and it's a virtual set and it's all real time composited. And uh, so I've got kind of a do it yourself system set up here that I'm getting ready to use for my next film, which is uh, going to be called Fed to the Dead. Uh, and it's a, I'm getting into the, zo the zombie uh, culture um, because, again, I've been into Walking Dead and stuff. So I'm like, you know, I got to do a project in this field. So uh, this film is a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a story about the, this couple on vacation get stranded at a bedside, a roadside bed and breakfast, and they come to discover that the owners are feeding their guests to a zombie in the basement. That's the basic premise. So that's, that's what we're working on right now. We're, uh, I've got the script ready, and I'm kind of in the pre-pre-production, but also working on some virtual um, production techniques because I think we're going to shoot a lot of it uh, either – I don't know if I can, we'll, we'll see. I may, I may get the virtual wall set up, but I may also shoot a lot of stuff um, green screen. And so I'm trying to get this, you know, this technology up and working. All right. So that, we wish you the best. Yeah. yeah. We wish yeah. you the best of luck with that. Now, where can everyone find you on social media and all the other uh, projects you have coming up in the near future? Social media, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram is J underscore Pometer. On, on Instagram, um, where my my wife, as we speak, is actually kind of uh, helping me with that. She uh, she's going to be working with me to help build that profile, and and we're going to be putting up some clips. We're gonna uh, we're gonna see if we can get Hollywood Girl on Instagram as well. Uh, it's on Amazon Prime. You can watch it there. You can watch it on YouTube, and we're gonna see if we can get the whole film up on uh, Instagram. Um, because a lot of people are, we're getting a lot of uh, questions through through Instagram now. So follow us there, J underscore Pometer. Absolutely, absolutely. We mm -hmm. want to take this opportunity to thank our guest, James Pometer, for being on our show today here at the interview series of Neuroculture. My name is Ryan. You can follow me and everything that we're doing here on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at It's Neuroculture. Make sure to check out our YouTube channel where all our videos, all these interviews, and all the other great, incredible things we have coming up. We drop videos every week, so check out our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, do all that stuff. And in the meantime, stay healthy, stay safe, stay strong. Check out Hollywood Girl, The Peg, and Twistle Story. You will not regret it. It is a wonderful film made by an amazing team of people. But in the meantime, take care and watch movies.